Okay, so thank you all for coming. Um, so I'm delighted to welcome our speaker for today, Professor Kathleen Bennett. Um, so many of you here will know Kathleen. Um, she's Associate Professor um, in pharma, uh, Pharmacoepidemiology and Biostatistics at the Population Health Sciences Division of the Royal College of Surgeons. Um, so she, Kathleen has worked for many years in um, statistical consultancy and a number of large collaborative projects. And I suppose you're going to talk to us today about some of your research um, over the past few years and the present research as well. So yeah. we'd like to welcome Kathleen. So we'll have plenty of time for questions. Um, at the end as well. Okay. So I'll let you. Thank you. Away. Thank you very much. much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for the invitation um, to come to speak to you today. So this is really a, a sort of a, a very uh, overview uh, presentation of work that I'm doing or have done in the past um, around pharmacoepidemiology. So I'm going to start off really just giving you an introduction to pharmacoepidemiology because. Um, some of you might not know what pharmacoepidemiology is, or maybe you do, but it's basically the study of the utilisation and the effects of medicines or drugs in large populations of, of people, um, large numbers of people. And it comes from uh, both pharmacology and epidemiology, so it bridges those two sciences together. And it is um, applying epidemiological reasoning and methods to pharmacological issues. Um, so this schematic just shows you what the types of research that we do using pharmacoepidemiology or what pharmacoepidemiology is used for. It's used for pharmacovigilance, which is looking at how medicines are used safely, drug utilisation, quality of prescribing, and um, pharmacoeconomics is in there as well. Sorry about the si sound effects there. I <laughs> don't know how they crept in there. Um, so some of the um, areas that pharmacoepidemiology focuses on research is looking at trends in prescribing, that's your utilisation, how drugs are used, the appropriateness of use, which I'm sure you're all familiar with in terms of the stop-start criteria, the beers criteria, these are ways of measuring how you, you medicines are used appropriately, medication adherence, how well people take their medicines, uh, predictors of medication use, um, information around uh, how medicine, lifestyle effects can influence medicines use, so things like healthy user effect, and you'll see this a lot in observational research when you're looking at medicines and you're, you're not randomising the medicines, the women or the you know, HRT, women who take HRT are more likely to in, um, be involved in healthy lifestyles in general, so this, there are lifestyle effects that, have, that can have effects on drugs and special populations. So we've done a bit of work in the elderly population particularly, but we've also looked at prescribing in children. Um, drug interactions, um, adverse uh, drug reactions, which is part of my current research that I'll be working on towards uh, in the next few years. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about uh, some of these, but not all of them. Um, and I'm sure I don't need to tell this group, the audience here, but there are different types of study designs that we can use to perform pharmacoepidemiological, pharmacoepidemiological studies. They're the very same study designs that we use in epidemiology. So the case control and the cohort study are probably our main uh, data designs, that, study designs that we use in um, looking at exposures, medicines and outcomes, um, whether it be adverse drug events or uh, hospitalizations or uh, uh, emergency visits um, to the emergency department. So we, we use all of these methodologies to uh, examine uh, the effects of drugs on outcomes and, and trends in prescribing. Um, as I say, observational studies do not come without some limitations, many limitations, um, one of them being that the treatment that we that we're looking at in terms of exposure is not allocated by chance. It's usually provide, given to the patient by the GP or the physician or the doctor in the hospital, um, and there is usually lots of bias associated with that, and particularly baseline risks for the disease. So, you know, somebody get, getting a drug or not getting a drug is going to be dependent on the severity of their disease and how long they've had the disease. So we cannot rule out con what's called confounding by indication, by the indication that the patient actually has this severe disease and they need treating. So that's a major limitation of uh, the types of research in terms of uh, observational studies. There's lots of other types of bias that we also see in uh, pharmacoepidemiology pharmacoepidemiological studies. Um, some of these you may have heard before in terms of epidemiological methods, but some may, uh, may be new to you. So one of them uh, is the protopathic bias, and this is a bias that creeps in when we are looking at um, 
a drug that may be used to treat the symptom of a disease but then is found to be associated with the outcome and it's not that there's a true association, it's just that the, tr the drug was more likely to be prescribed for the symptoms of the disease rather than rather and, and then found to be associated but there's actually no direct relationship in terms of the whether it be you know uh, PPIs and cancer, gastric cancer, PPIs are being treated for some reflux which may be a symptom of the gastric cancer and then the PPIs are found to be more associated with the cancer, but actually it's not, not that, it's a protopathic bias. Detection bias is where you are more likely to be detecting, for example, um, uh, metformin in diabetes. If patients are going to see their GP more frequently, they may be picked up for other diseases or other. they might have other interventions like a, a, a gastrointestinal scope, which then leads to more detection of other other diseases, other things. So that's that's the type of bias that we need to control for. Healthy user effect, I've, I've mentioned already, and then confounding by indication, so a channeling effect of the drug being given to certain more diseased or severely diseased patients than others. We can control for some of these in the design of our studies and in the analysis. So in the analysis, we usually try and adjust for them in terms of confounders in our regression analysis, um, or we can try and adjust for them at the design stage in using propensity score matching or um, a, you know, case control match study, nested case control match study. So some of the other reasons why we, we mainly perf perform pharmacopoeia studies is not just for research, but to inform the regulatory process for early approval of medicines to um, support applications for marketing in other drugs, ma marketing in other countries, but also, you know, increase marketing of the drug, assist in the repositioning of drugs. So, for example, if it has a new indication, um, you know, we might use um, some of the research, uh, to, we might perform pharmacoepidemiologies to help with that. And also, obviously, uh, post-marketing surveillance is very important in terms of adverse effects. So after a drug has been marketed, we want to see how much is this drug how much does it cause adverse effects in the population that may not have been picked up in a, um, a randomised controlled trial? You have a much wider population that you're, 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 that you're looking at. Um, and also we might want to, a bit like similar to the post-marketing surveillance, you might see that there's problems with the drugs before they're um, marketed and that you want to make sure that you're, you're not missing any, anything serious that might crop up once it's been um, um, given to the population, a wider population, who are not homogeneous and who are not the trial, randomised control, control trial population. So these are reasons for, for looking at um, the use of medicines in populations. Uh, so pharmacovigilance is probably one of the, the sort of main um, interests as well, in that it's a type of continually moni continual monitoring for unwanted effects and so safety-related effects of drugs that are currently on the market. So, you know, it, it's it's almost exclusively at the moment uh, sort of sp spontaneous reporting systems where healthcare professionals who might see something that looks uh, like it could be an adverse drug reaction, they would report that to the central agency in the, H the in this case in Ireland, the HPRA, the Health uh, Health Protection uh, Regulatory Authority. Um, so it does rely heavily on reporting of safety effects by the health professionals. Um, so just a little bit of background to uh, why pharmacoepidemiology is maybe more, you know, currently sort of more uh, more known now. Um, you know, the, 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 food, the U.S. Uh, introduced the Food Drug Act in 1906, that led to the Food and Drug and Cosmetic Act in 1938. Um, so before that, preclinical toxicity data and clinical data about safety was required before the drug was marketed. Um, however, in 1961, there was a, a disaster with uh, thalidomide, uh, a drug that was used in pregnant women, um, particularly for nausea and uh, as a sedative. And it was found to cause uh, congenital abnormalities. So this was published in The Lancet in 1961. And this was uh, McBride who at the time reported some unusual uh, or you know, very uh, severe congenital abnormalities and he was asking the readers, has anyone seen any similar ab abnormalities in babies delivered to women who have been on this drug? So this was the first example of where uh, you know, we see um, the, the safety of medicines sort of, and the use of medicines being sort of quite uh, sort of well sort of presented. Um, in, the, in, in this way, and um, you know, this is sort of the start, I suppose, of, of continuing medicines regulation and, and safety is quite important, it's very important now in any sort of regulatory process. 
Um, so pharmacoepidemiology was sort of uh, came about really from uh, first appeared in the medical literature around 1984. Um, in Ireland, uh, we've you know pharmacoepidemiology. We've been doing research in this about 20 years, more than 20 years. Uh, but the introduction of the yellow card system for ADR reporting was introduced in um, 1996. Um, however, even now, this, this, this is quite an old slide now, but even now the reporting is still much lower in terms of adverse drug reactions um, than, than maybe uh, you might expect. So I think it's, it's really down to the doctors to, to, you know, when they see an ADR, they, 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 they report it. Um, so well, I'm going to really talk about some of the research that I've been doing with uh, the data that we have access to in Ireland, which is using the Primary Care Reimbursement Services, the PCRS database, which is uh, basically the, all of the pharmacy claims that, we, that, that are dispensed from all the pharmacies in the Republic of Ireland. It's used for mainly for financial purposes, so the pharmacists send their claims to the PCRS, the PCRS pay the pharmacists for, that, for those dispensed medicines. And um, the, the main database or data that we use is from the General Medical Services Scheme or the GMS Scheme. There are several other schemes as well, community drug schemes, the long-term illness and the drug payment scheme, but because the GMS captures all of the prescribing and um, it's not ca capturing all of the population, but it captures a large percentage of the population and a large proportion of the prescribing, um, we have used it quite effectively to, 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 do, to do our research. Um, it's based on means testing for those under 70. Um, well, there is a means testing over 70 from, De from December, January 2009, but the means testing for the over 70s is much higher, so we capture about 97% of the over 70s. Um, we, it, we have all the information on the prescribing, the drugs dispensed, the quantity dose, the type of drug. Uh, we have uh, what's called an ATC code, which is a code that we, which is an internationally recognized code for coding the drugs. Um, so that we can group them together. However, we don't have any information on diagnosis or outcomes with this data set. So what we have been able to do with, uh, with uh, ethical approval and patient consent is to link some of this information to patient outcomes or diagnosis and, and get some more information about how the medicines have an impact on outcomes. So this is a busy slide, but just to focus on, this is how medicines in the GMS have changed over time by age group. So on the x-axis we have the age group, so going from the youngest to the oldest, over 65s, um, and we have the colour coding is basically how many drugs, um, how many medicines were prescribed in that year um, for that age group. So in 1997, um, polypharmacy, which we would count as five or more concurrent drugs, uh, was about 18% in the over 65s. By 2012, polypharmacy, according to the five plus medicines, was around 60%. So the use of medicines over time has increased exponentially, and it's very clear from this graph, it's not just in the youngest, in the oldest age groups, it's actually happening across all age groups, particularly from 44 um, plus. So that, that's what, what we wouldn't expect anything different really because we know that there's more drugs available so, um, and, and we're more aware of the, of the impact of the effect of these drugs. So my title was The Good, The Bad and The Ugly. So it's from the Hollywood movie that was, is literally is 50 years old this year. Um, so I had to dig around to find this uh, picture. But the good, so I'm going to start with some good news in terms of some of the good news stories um, that we found from our work. Um, I'm going to start with aspirin. So I'm sure everyone has heard of aspirin. It's a very common drug. It's used, uh, it's derived from the bark of the willow tree, um, and it's, it's an antiplatelet therapy. It was marketed in 1899 by Bayer as an analgesic, but it's now prescribed widely for cardiovascular disease, um, but also for cancer as well. It's on the WHO list of essential medicines, and a lot of it is made every year and consumed every year. Uh, about 100 billion tablets. So a very common drug. Aspirin saves lives as well. Um, if we treated 1,000 people over 60 with aspirin and they took it every day for 10 years, we would save around 17 lives, um, and that's preventing cancers and heart disease or heart attacks. So most of those lives are actually saved uh, from, uh, by cancer, uh, saving lives from cancer. And then, but we also have a knock-on effect that there's risk associated with taking aspirin. So there's an increased risk of strokes, bleeding, and ulcers. Um, about two to three deaths in that in that ten year. 
Um, so what we need to know is, I suppose, is um, how, how, what dose we, uh, people should be on, how long they should take it and who should take it and how do we identify that. So this is just a slide from the Cancer Research UK, but we've, we've, um, we, we've been looking at aspirin, particularly in relation to breast cancer. Um, I suppose one of the uh, side effects of taking aspirin is the increased risk of, in, in, of bleeding. And this seems to increase with age and also um, has, there's a, 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 there's a pink dotted line, um, increases uh, a, a, across time as well. So if you're on it for longer, uh, then you're more likely to have bleeds. It's about one to two bleeds per, per thousand person years, I think is the, the figure for anyone who's on aspirin. So it's, it's, it, is a, a, it has its side effects. So, um, so we have an interest in looking at aspirin in relation to preventing or looking at cancer. Um, several studies have been published and evidence is emerging that there is a link between aspirin and reduced risk of cancer, cancer particularly colorectal cancer. So if there's a high risk of colorectal cancer in your family or uh, you have a high risk of, of colorectal cancer, aspirin actually helps pre prevent that, that developing. Um, also metastatic disease, metastatic cancer, and also death. It's, there's lots of evidence now um, showing that. Some of the observational research is a bit conflicting due to different study designs and the dosing of aspirin. Um, but the laboratory evidence, the preclinical evidence, seems to suggest aspirin does have a beneficial effect in reducing the spread of cancer via various mechanisms. So... Um, these are some of the published uh, studies that are in the Lancet around 2011-12. There were a number of articles published sort of around, around that time based on randomised controlled evidence of all of the trials that were, were done using looking at aspirin versus placebo, but the, out, the uh, main outcome was looking at cardiovascular disease. However, these, these investigators, uh, Professor Rothwell in Oxford, um, were they were also able to look at cancer outcomes as well. So they were able to look at all of the cancers that these people developed and died, whether they died from the cancer. So when they looked at the long-term risk of death from cancer, in their individual patient level data from randomized controlled trials, so these are properly conducted randomized controlled trials, they found that after uh, five years of aspirin, um, the risk of dying from cancer was reduced uh, about 34% at five years. So there's quite a big uh, difference there between um, uh, the aspirin and the placebo group. And that uh, was statistically significant. So they also looked at uh, the risk of um, daily aspirin, the use of aspirin on risk of met cancer metastases. And they looked at all of the uh, incident cancers during those randomized controlled trials. And they found that in the five randomized controlled trials, there were around 1,000 uh, cancers that were diagnosed, and aspirin um, reduced the risk of distant metastases uh, by about 36%. So about a third of the population who were on aspirin um, were, had a lower risk of uh, distant metastases. And that was also statistically significant. So that's in a study of around 17,000 um, uh, patients. So these, these results from randomized control trials, although they weren't designed to look at cancer, are very, um, you know, very strong evidence for their, their the effect of aspirin. So, uh, so within the trials, uh, the authors also looked at subgroups of different types of cancers, and they found that this result of distant risk of distant metastases being reduced in the aspirin arm were uh, consistently uh, seen across all of the cancers. However, because of the numbers being um, quite small for some of these cancers, the, the evidence uh, didn't reach statistical significance. You can see the confidence intervals around some of these odds ratios is very wide. Um, the only one that showed statistical um, significant improvement with aspirin was the colorectal cancer, which is one that, that comes out quite, quite strongly in other studies. The breast cancer, um, so what we, we have an odds ratio of about 0 0.5 there. So just a little bit about breast cancer, because this is the work that we've been doing. We've um, been funded by the Irish Cancer Society and the HRB to, to look at the impact of aspirin on, on breast cancer and outcomes of breast cancer. So in Ireland, about one in 10 women um, have, a chance, have one in 10 chance of developing um, breast cancer over their lifetime. The increase uh, is the, this global increase um, due to improved screening and changes in lifestyle f uh, factors. And by 2035, it's predicted that two and a half million um, uh, women uh, will will have uh, will be that that's how much the increase will be um, over that time frame. So, 
As I mentioned before, we've been able to use uh, the PCRS and link it to other data sets. So we've linked the PCRS, the Primary Care Reinvestment Services data, to the National Cancer Registry in Ireland. And um, this information, this cancer registry provides us details on all of the cancers diagnosed. Um, it, there's a designated hospital-based tumour registration officer who collects all the detailed information about the cancer, the tumour, the treatment characteristics. And it's around 97% complete. Um, so the anonymised data held by the Cancer Registry um, is uh, covered by the Health, Protect Health Act and it has information on cause of death and date of death. So we've managed to link, or the Cancer Registry have linked this to their medical card patients only. So uh, about half of the breast cancer population have a medical card. So we've been able to look at uh, medicines use in that, in that population. So we've designed a study um, looking at the use of aspirin before diagnosis of breast cancer diagnosis and we've e examined the exposure up to three years before their diagnosis. So women who are diagnosed, um, that's the sort of the, the picture in the middle there, um, we looked at their status, their lymph node status, so whether the cancer spread to the lymph nodes or not. So we had lymph node positive and negative women in, in our, in our um, group, in our population that we studied. And we looked back at all of the exposure before their diagnosis to see how much were they exposed to aspirin and for how long and, and whether or not they, they received aspirin. And we had a population of around just under 2,800 women in this study. Um, and we followed them up um, for at least five years after uh, for mortality. And the results... <laughs> are that when we look at the use of aspirin in predicting lymph node metastases at diagnosis, um, aspirin reduced the risk of, of women presenting with lymph node positive disease at, at diagnosis. And this, there was a dose-response relationship between um, uh, infrequent use and frequent use. So the more frequently used the aspirin was, the lower their risk of, of spread, lymph node spread to the, to, uh, within this cohort. Um, we also found that women who um, were lymph node negative, which is where it hadn't spread, had a much, much greater uh, beneficial survival benefit with the aspirin, pre-diagnostic aspirin use. So their risk of dying if they were negative at diagnosis was, um, uh, it has a ratio of 0.55 or a 45% reduced risk of mortality in that population, but no benefit in terms of risk uh, re or reduce, um, improve survival in the node positive group. So we do see a, d a definite beneficial effect for some women in having been on aspirin before their diagnosis of uh, breast cancer and the outcomes are um, very evident in terms of mortality. So this uh, research that we've, we've published is part of uh, an Irish Research Council research uh, collaboration, um, Cancer Research Centre. It's the first cancer research centre called Breast Predict in Ireland. It kicked off in 2013. Mm -hmm. It's funded by the Irish Cancer Society um, and uh, it brings together like-minded researchers interested in uh, breast cancer research from various different disciplines across <coughs> Ireland with a common goal of improving the outlook for cancer patients in Ireland and worldwide. So this has meant that we can actually look at the molecular mechanisms around how is aspirin having this impact on women's uh, uh, nodal status at diagnosis. So we're working with biologists and um, cell biologists, molecular biologists in terms of trying to understand the me mechanisms behind why we, why we see these um, population um, wide um, uh, event uh, results. So, so that's that's kind of one of the research areas that we're working on. So I'm just going to uh, follow up with some just over some other examples of um, research that we've been doing. So another area that we've found that there's good news. I suppose the good news story is the use of antibiotics in the in the populations um, in our over, over 65 children and younger adults. So we've looked at the number of uh, items and the rate of prescribing over a number of years and what we found is that the number of items and this also goes for the number of defined daily doses the drug doses average recommended daily dose for an adult um, have been reducing over time which is a good news story so we're seeing a reduction in antibiotic use um, across uh, a number of years but we're also seeing it across a number of age groups particularly uh, the younger age groups so in terms of the under 16s, the 16 to 44s, and the 45 to 64s, there is there is a reduction in the use of these medicines or antibiotics in the population. 
Um, however, just the one downside, not so good news, is that it's, it seems to be increasing um, for the over 65. So although uh, some good work is being done, I know um, uh, the HPSC and uh, Dr. Lula O'Connor is involved in, in, um, in working towards uh, reducing antimicrobial use. Uh, there's still some work to do in the older age groups in terms of uh, uh, their use of, of, these, of these medicines. So um, it, it's uh, generally a good news story. In particularly, the, un the, um, the youngest age groups, we see a significant reduction in the coamoxiclav, which is a broad-spectrum antibiotic, which um, is, is good news, I suppose, for, for antimicrobial resistance. So we, these are the kind of what we call drug utilisation studies that we can do to look at uh, trends in prescribing in the population and, and try to uh, see if there's any changes after interventions have been introduced. So there are a couple of good news stories. I'm going to move on to the bad and the ugly, which are maybe not so good, but they, they're basically looking at um, inappropriate use of medicines or polypharmacy and their impacts on adverse events. So this is a study where we looked at linking uh, the PCRS to the TILDA participants. So TILDA is the longitudinal study of ageing, which I'm sure um, most of you are aware of, but about 35% of TILDA participants provided their medical card numbers and, and allowed us use, use of that to link to the PCRS data. So what we've been able to do is look at uh, use of medicines at the different waves of TILDA. So this is just using the wave one um, where we had information on falls risk. Uh, so we knew if, if uh, patients had, fall, had a fall within the last 12 months and we looked then at their, their use of um, multiple medicines, so polypharmacy, five or more medicines. Um, when the medicines included antidepressants, that was associated with a significant risk of any fall, injurious fall, or, or in the number of falls. So having antidepressants within your polypharmacy mix was actually um, not, not good for, for the patient in terms of their falls risk. In addition, polypharmacy that had benzodiazepines associated was, was more associated with more injurious falls. So there were a greater number of injurious falls if the polypharmacy included uh, benzodiazepines. So th this is work that uh, was done by a PhD student in, in uh, Professor Roseanne Kenny's group. Um, as well as that, we've used the TILDA data set that we've, like, I've just described to look at um, what happens after two years, so at wave two, if people continue taking their um, inappropriate medicines, uh, PIP, as we call potentially inappropriate medicines, what is the risk of having a further um, uh, adverse outcomes? So we looked at uh, higher rates of emergency department visits and GP visits, and we found that when we looked at the, the stop and the start criteria, which I haven't explained because I thought most people have probably heard of stop and start being in Cork, um, that we found that PIP, potentially inappropriate prescribing, was was detected in 57% of our over 65 population in the tilde link data set. Remember, that this is, these are the patients who have a medical card, so the 65 to 69 are going to be the means-tested population, and over 70 then is, is, not, is not as, as means, it, there is some means testing, but it's a higher level. So what we found was that there was a high level of potentially inappropriate prescribing defined by the stop and the start criteria. Um, any stop criterion was associated with higher rates of emergency department visits, a 30% increased uh, risk, rate, uh, risk ratio there, and also GP visits. Um, when patients were identified as having two or more start criteria, they had significantly more um, emergency visits, uh, around 45% more likely, and increased GP visits. So the, the, the conclusion from this is that you know the PIP um, does actually increase risks of um, hospital admission or hospital um, visits and GP visits as well. So it's, it's to try maybe, um, I think the conclusion was that we, you know, maybe reviewing our medicines regularly is, is, a, is a way around to some reducing some of this. Okay, and then just so finally, this is a very similar study, but in a different cohort uh, that was done in, in um, the eastern region, Dublin and um, Dublin area, and it was a, a cohort of uh, over 70s, about 930 community whirling patients from 15 practices, and we examined the potentially inappropriate prescribing, and we also looked at their um, at likelihood of having an adverse drug event, um, and we found, like the previous work, that patients with at least two potentially inappropriate prescribing indicators were twice as likely to have an adverse drug event. They were had lower mean quality of life 
and they had a twice-fold uh, increased risk of uh, emergency visits. So it's just com compounding or sort of confirming what we had uh, already seen in the TILDA cohort as well. So we've been doing some work in this as well. So just to finish up with the ugly, um, and this is kind of really bad as well, this is just where things haven't really, you know, something's happened but the prescribing hasn't really changed. So this is where we did a, a study in a hospital emergency department in St. James's Hospital and we had a database of all of the patients who'd come in having had a fall. Um, we didn't look, we just looked at falls and we looked at medicines used before and after their fall to see had it changed subsequently. So they had, they came in, they had a fall, they were on a certain number of medicines, were they, were they altered after? So it was a before and after design. We had about a thousand eligible individuals and we found that before they had the fall, about 53% had any stop criteria. But after the fall, this only slightly increased to 53%, 53.7%. There was no change in their use of inappropriate prescribing indicators um, before or after the fall. So it wasn't that anything was being done while they were in hospital. There was a small decrease in the use of neuroleptics and long-acting benzodiazep benzodiazepines, which was significant, but um, in, in, in relation to that, we also saw that there was an increased use of anxiolytics and hypnosedatives that were initiated as a result of the fall. Uh, between 9 and 15% were initiated a new anxiolytic or hypnotic for the first time. So that would indicate maybe that, uh, that maybe they perhaps shouldn't have been prescribed these drugs because it could lead to another fall in the future. We don't know. We, we didn't follow these patients up. But um, we, we, you know, there, is, there is some work to do, I think, in looking at reviewing medicines in this, in the, um, in this, uh, in this group of patients who have falls. There was a large percentage who had polypharmacy, which was a strong predictor of uh, potentially inappropriate prescribing, a fourfold increase if she had polypharmacy. So that's, that's a, uh, one study. We, we actually were planning to develop uh, looking at interventions around falls, reducing falls risk in, in, in the emergency department as a, result of this, uh, as a result of this work. So the last uh, example then is I'm going to talk about is medication taking behaviours. Um, so these are basically looking at ways that people take their medicines. There's two different sort of ways that we describe it is non-adherence and non-persistence. So non-adherence is is whether or not the patient takes their medicines. Um, they take them, but not, not routinely or regularly. So they stop a dose or they, they, miss, a, uh, um, uh, they, they miss a day. Um, and non-persistence is where they just stop taking the drug and they don't return to that. So they have a big gap of the, they've been taking it and then they just stop. So the two different ways of describing um, medication taking behavior. So we, we know from a review of the literature by Di Matteo that if you, um, that good outcomes are three times higher in the adherent versus the non-adherent population, and they looked at a number of different outcome measures across different disease areas. There's also cost consequences for not taking your medicines due to increased complications, resources, and use, you know, un untimely death. So we, we looked at the, the use of um, um, hormonal therapy in women with breast cancer. You can see we have an interest in breast cancer. So we, we defined cases as women with, who have had a breast cancer recurrence within, within four years of their hormone therapy initiation. And these were matched to a group of controls that didn't have a recurrence of their breast cancer. And we matched them by tumor stage and age at diagnosis. Um, what we did then was to look back at uh, at the previous uh, four years to see if the women uh, were persistent with their hormone therapy um, in, in that time frame. What we found was that the women who were non-persistent uh, had a, a three-fold increased risk of recurrence, which is not surprising if you, if you, you know, um, hormonal therapy reduces your risk of recurrence by about 50%, so if you're not taking your drug, it's going to increase your risk of recurrence. So we found a three-fold increase, but uh, there was no association with non-compliance, which is the not taking it every day, you skip a dose. So it was the persistence, the non-persistence that actually de uh, determined uh, risk of recurrence in this population um, of breast cancer uh, patients. So that's uh, another example where maybe if we introduce more intervention around uh, increasing um, uptake or um, persistence with therapy, uh, that, that may have improved outcomes for, for these women. There are lots of reasons why women don't take medicines, uh, why they don't take the hormone therapy. There's a lot of side effects with the drugs, and that, that may have influenced their reason for stopping. 
So, uh, so that really brings me then nicely to what I'm doing now, which is I'm uh, funded by the HRB as a research leader, and I'm going to be focusing on medication quality and safety, so all of the examples that I've shown you, and it's really about understanding, uh, documenting and supporting um, interventions around improving medication, prescribing and adherence, and in ultimately to reduce uh, adverse drug reactions and improve health outcomes. So we're using a lot of the existing data sets that I've spoken about to, to inform this research, but also we'll be developing, looking at developing new interventions to improve prescribing um, and adherence. So um, as well as this, uh, there's an element of capacity building um, and collaboration and networks that we're working towards over the next five years. That's the plan. Um, so there's three work packages that I'm um, that we, we have in, in that have started now. We've got uh, one work package which is just looking at adverse drug events in primary and secondary care, looking at the hospital pa patients who get to hospital having had an adverse drug reaction. Um, we've got a medication adherence work package which is following on the work that we've we've been doing. And then a work package looking at the economics of the impact of um, adverse drug events in the population. So trying to cost, how much does it cost for the, the, the visit to the ED department when actually if, if it had been uh, prevented uh, in the first place, that, that may not have been required. So we're, we're looking at different um, uh, uh, models for economic impact of ADEs. And with the three uh, people that have started, Katrina, who might be known to some of you, Dr. Katrina Kaiser, postdoc, uh, PhD, she did her PhD under the Sphere program. Um, we've got a new PhD Sphere program scholar, Caroline Walsh, who's a pharmacist, and we have a postdoc fellow uh, who's also a pharmacist. Um, pharmacists tend to be very good quantitative researchers, so, um, and especially in this area, so that's, that's it. So just to finish up with the uh, conclusion then, obviously medicines have a huge uh, influence on our, on our lives and uh, increasing significance as well as, as we move towards uh, sort of more regulation, particularly um, in the population perspective, it's important to impact their, their, their impact on overall uh, patterns of disease and their outcomes, um, and also with costs as well, which is something we'll be looking at uh, in our work package three. And that's it, just to acknowledge uh, my collaborators, funders, and people that have helped us along the way. Um, and that's it, so thank you very much. Finish with Clint. <laughs> thank you.